And it's Sampras serving for the set. Oh, great return there by Agassi. And a lovely volley by Rafter. What? Hang on, now Capriati's returned that one. Ruzetsky, where did he come from? Back by Hingis. What? No, it's Henman. Oh, I give up. There is an additional digital satellite service from the BBC which allows you to choose which match you want to watch during Wimbledon. Just push the red button on your remote control. But try not to get too carried away. Wimbledon Interactive, putting you in control. Three years ago, Panorama revealed the shocking mortality rate of the Children's Heart Unit in Bristol. It was a closed world where parents were unaware of the surgeon's ability kept in the dark about the risks involved. With the impending report into the Bristol Heart Baby tragedy, Panorama asks, has enough been done to restore our trust in doctors? Could Bristol happen elsewhere? Panorama, exposing the truth. Tonight at 10.15 on BBC One. The early evening news now on BBC One with Sarah Montague. The Home Secretary admits the Bulger killers face real dangers after their release. He's called for everyone involved in the case to take a deep breath. At least 50 are dead and hundreds more are injured after an earthquake in Peru. And, gotcha, Foster finally falls for the Lady in Red. Good afternoon. The Home Secretary, David Blunkett, has acknowledged that James Bulger's killers could face real dangers after their release. It's eight years since John Venables and Robert Thompson were convicted of the two-year-old's murder. Now they are to be freed, Venables' mother fears her son will be killed by vigilantes. Mr Blunkett has called for restraint. James Bulger was remembered in prayers at church services across Merseyside today. There were also words to encourage forgiveness, but that may prove more difficult in an atmosphere where so many people believe his killers should still be in custody. Concerned about the safety of John Venables and Robert Thompson, the new Home Secretary appealed for calm. I think we all need to take a deep breath and to view what is said and done as we would view it if it were taking place in any other country. We're not in uh, the, 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 the Midwest in the mid-19th century. We're in Britain in the 21st century and we'll deal with things effectively uh, and we'll deal with them in a civilised manner. He's referring partly to the volume of coverage in the media about the risks to the teenagers. One newspaper quotes John Venable's mother fearing her son could be killed by vigilantes within a month. But friends of the Bulger family blame the public outcry on the judge who decided that the teenagers were ready to be considered for release. Many members of the public in this country believe that justice hasn't been done, and I too believe justice hasn't been done. And Lord Chief Justice Wolfe has basically put the lives of Venables and Thompson at much greater risk now than he would have done had they served the tariff for, say, another three or four years. The Home Office says the protection given to Thompson and Venables will be constantly reviewed, as it would be for anyone at risk. Within the community, the focus is on supporting all those involved in this exceptional case. In the long term, people need to find forgiveness because you cannot build a community, you cannot really build a positive life if you're taken up with anger and hurt and, and revenge. For James Bolger's mother and other campaigners at the heart of this tragedy, that will be difficult. Christine Stewart, BBC News. Nearly 50 people have been killed and hundreds more injured in a powerful earthquake in southern Peru. Rescue teams are trying to get aid to areas devastated by the quake. The destruction is worst around the cities of Moquegua and Arequipa. This was the strongest earthquake to hit Peru for 30 years. As buildings collapsed, terrified residents were left scrambling across rubble. Fearing more tremors and aftershocks, many have remained in the streets. But it's winter in Peru and at altitude, temperatures are falling. <laughs> At least 47 people are known to have died and more than 500 are reported to be injured. The Peruvian authorities have declared a state of emergency. The army is flying in medical supplies as well as food and blankets from the capital, Lima. Some of the worst damage has been in the country's second city, Arequipa. As well as destroying homes, the earthquake has damaged around a third of its historic buildings, including the cathedral. 
According to the US Geological Survey, the earthquake, measuring around 7 on the Richter scale, was centred off the Pacific coast. It was felt as far away as Bolivia, and in Chile there was extensive damage in the northern town of Arica. With many roads in the region blocked and telephone lines cut, it may take some time before the numbers of casualties in more remote settlements can be assessed. The European Union says it's ready to provide emergency funding if it receives requests for aid from humanitarian agencies. Daniel Bircher, BBC News. Police in Essex are continuing to question a man over the disappearance of a 15-year-old girl. Danielle Jones was last seen nearly a week ago after leaving her home in East Tilbury to go to school. Hello. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> More house-to-house -house inquiries today. Essex police are talking to as many people in the community as possible about the disappearance. Danielle Jones, who's 15, was wearing her school uniform when she went missing last Monday morning when she should have gone to school. It now transpires a school friend sent her a text message asking where she was after she failed to catch the school bus. Yesterday, Danielle's distraught parents, Linda and Tony, made an emotional appeal for her return, describing her as a typical 15-year-old with no worries. Up, up the road, up by, on the way to St. Clair's, yeah. While local people spoke of little else, the police expressed concern for Danielle's safety. Everybody collectively says they cannot understand where she's gone or why she'd go. And on the basis of that, with everybody telling us the same thing, that's why I'm so worried. In the absence of any information whatsoever about Danielle's whereabouts, detectives are planning a high-profile operation at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning here in the road where she was last seen. Meanwhile, the police have been granted an extension to continue to question a local man in his 40s on suspicion of abduction. John McIntyre, BBC News, Tilbury in Essex. Loyalist paramilitaries are being blamed for the murder of a 26-year-old Catholic man in his house in Coleraine last night. He had been due to give evidence against a number of people accused of shooting an 11-year-old girl in a Loyalist feud, but had pulled out because of fears for his safety. The RUC has condemned the action of those involved. All four declared contenders for the Conservative Party leadership took to the airwaves today as the campaign turned into a battle of television interviews. The Shadow Chancellor, Michael Portillo, was questioned again about his past, but insisted that potential supporters need have no fears of further revelations about his private life. Michael Portillo admitted he'd had gay experiences in his youth to end years of damaging speculation. Some MPs have withheld their support from his leadership bid because they worried there might be further revelations. This morning, Mr Portillo reassured them they've nothing to fear. I've been completely straightforward about this. And I don't think any politician has been as straightforward as I have been. And I've, not, I've nothing to add to that. Mr Portillo has urged his party to be more tolerant of different lifestyles. Ian Duncan Smith, seen as a champion of traditional values, says he too wants the Conservatives to embrace those who choose not to marry, but without diminishing their support for the family. We do need to recognise that there are other, uh, other relationships, other lifestyles out there which themselves for the sake of the children and others, we need to be uh, a little more positive about it. David Davis, his fellow rival from the right, was initially brought up by a lone parent. He says the Tories should worry less about lifestyles and more about the damage the benefit system does to all kinds of families. We've Good. got to do that with one of the worst welfare systems that I've ever seen. But the you working can... family tax credit, tax credit. Now, the priority, actually, bluntly, is to get out of the dependency culture. With little to distinguish the candidates on policy, the fourth, Michael Ancrum, urged his rivals to avoid attacking each other. We want to come out of this campaign, whoever wins, we want to come out stronger and more united than when we go into it. And we're not going to do that if we indulge in, in the politics of personalities. If Kenneth Clark enters the race, the debate would turn to policy. But the policy he differs from his rivals over is Europe, still the most divisive issue in Conservative politics. Sean Lay, BBC News. The European Union's foreign policy chief, Javier Solana, has secured a new ceasefire in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Macedonian forces have been bombarding ethnic Albanian rebels for the past few days in an offensive which broke a previous ceasefire that lasted 11 days. Thousands of anti-capitalist demonstrators have clashed with police in the Spanish city of Barcelona. Riot police were called in after protesters attacked the Department of Industry. The World Bank has cancelled a meeting due to start there tomorrow because of the protests. A volcano in the Philippines has erupted, sending clouds of ash more than nine miles into the air. 
at least 7,000 villagers living near the Mayon volcano have left their homes. Experts say it could be throwing out lava and red-hot boulders for several days. A leading charity has said cancer patients in Europe are dying because of delays in introducing life-saving drugs. The cancer research campaign says it takes an average of four years between drugs being approved and national governments agreeing to use them. Graham Morris was told he had a brain tumour at the beginning of last year. Doctors told him the newest drug was not yet being paid for by the NHS, although it was available abroad. He was able to get it free because his brother-in-law worked for a drug company. Through a family connection, I got the most up-to-date drug, which I would never have got um, through the NHS. And as far as I'm concerned, it saved my life. It had taken 10 years to develop the drug Temodal in the laboratories of a cancer charity. The research was carried out here in the UK, but it was made widely available to patients in other countries more quickly. The charity wants to know why breakthroughs in treatment are reaching patients faster in countries like Sweden than the UK. We're up to three years slower than the very best in Europe, and we can be four years slower than America in getting new effective drugs for cancer to uh, British cancer patients, and that is just far, far too long. Improving cancer treatment is one of the government's stated priorities. It says it's putting millions into ending the drugs lottery and making sure all cancer patients get access to effective new treatments. Brownwyn Jeffries, BBC News, the Department of Health. Tens of thousands of people have attended a mass celebrated by Pope John Paul on the second day of his visit to Ukraine. He appealed for an end to the thousand-year-old split between the Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. The Pope arrived at a rain-soaked airfield to find an estimated 40,000 people, far fewer than expected. But his message was intended for the country as a whole. The Pope appealed to Ukrainians to learn from medieval Kiev, when Orthodox and Roman Catholic Christians lived in harmony. We want the single baptism that we share, he said, to restore such a state of communion between us that any difference of traditions poses no obstacle to unity. Up till now, Ukraine's been known more for the disaster of Chernobyl, for dubious political standards and for economic failure. But the country's Catholic population hopes the Pope's visit will represent the chance of a new beginning as a modern European nation. Success in Ukraine will nourish the Pope's hope one day to travel to Moscow to seek reconciliation with the large Russian Orthodox Church. It's very important uh, and uh, in Moscow many people uh, wait this visit. Tomorrow the Pope travels to Lviv, the heart of Ukrainian Catholicism. Whatever the reaction of other Christians, he'll be determined to strengthen and encourage the Catholic Church there. Robert Pigott, BBC News, Kiev. Sport and Michael Schumacher has won the European Grand Prix at the Nürburgring in Germany. He now leads the Drivers' Championship by 24 points and needs just two more wins to equal Alain Prost's record of 51 Grand Prix victories. Daniela Ralph reports. It wasn't all plain sailing for Michael Schumacher. On the warm-up lap, there were problems with his Ferrari. He had to borrow a bike to get back to the reserve car. Not that it had any effect on his performance. He made a strong start with his brother Ralph in the Williams BMW close behind. It was looking like a leisurely afternoon out for the Schumacher family. No one else was in sight as the brothers competed in their own race. But at both pit stops, the family party was about to be ruined. Ralph Schumacher was penalised for crossing the white line back onto the track. The violation meant he had to return to the pit for 10 seconds. It allowed his older brother to cruise to victory, ahead of Juan Pablo Montoya and David Coulthard. Ralph Schumacher eventually finished fourth. The win on this circuit, close to where the Schumachers grew up, was Michael's fifth of the season. The homecoming reinforced his lead in the Drivers' Championship. Daniel Orwell, BBC News. The British 400-metre runner Mark Richardson made his comeback today after a two-year ban for testing positive for Nandrolone. He ran the final leg of the 400-metre relay at the European Cup in Bremen, crossing the line in fourth place. The British men's team were defending their European title but could finish only fifth this time. The women came fourth. Rugby Union and Lawrence Delalio is pulled out of the Lions tour of Australia with a knee injury. Meanwhile, the New South Wales fullback Duncan McRae has been banned for seven weeks 
for punching Ronan O'Gara in yesterday's match against the Lions. Wimbledon begins tomorrow, and if you normally sit in front of your television cursing the BBC producer who insists on showing you a match on centre court when really you'd rather see number one court, this year you're in luck. The digital revolution means you'll be able to choose which one to watch. Jane Hughes reports. A last-minute sprinkle for the hallowed turf as officials brace themselves for the busiest fortnight of their year. The sun's shining for now, the players are ready, it's looking much like any other Wimbledon fortnight. To stand by the but behind the scenes, this small team's aiming to break new technological ground in Wimbledon 2001 by offering digital satellite viewers the choice between five different matches at any one time. The system's operated through your remote control. Once you're tuned to Wimbledon, you press the red button. You can then choose to watch one of five different matches, or if you really want to keep across what's going on, you can watch all five at once. It's supposed to be the closest you can get to actually being here without leaving your living room. A separate team constantly updates scores, players, statistics and profiles for an extra service on digital TV that viewers can check while they're watching a match. It's cutting-edge technology, which the BBC hopes will keep it ahead of the game and in a strong position when bidding for sporting rights. What we know from the research we've done, people really like the idea of being able to pull up the scores from all the different courts, pull up the video from the different courts, find out what's going on, what's coming up, and, and actually have some choice over what they watch, particularly when there's so much going on all at the same time. But for these fans, it can't compete with the real thing. They've been waiting all weekend for centre court seats. Some traditions here never change. Jane Hughes, BBC News, Wimbledon. Well, after a week on the run, Foster the Vulture is back in the hands of his keepers. The three-year-old bird had managed to evade his captors at a garden in Suffolk. But following a quick struggle this afternoon, it was all over. Day seven of Foster's remarkable adventure began with the three-year-old vulture once again calling all the shots. A battle of wills between Bird and falconer Joanna Lobb. A battle Bird appeared to be winning. Well, this has been the pattern throughout the day. Falconer getting ever closer to Vulture, but never quite close enough. But then suddenly, Foster momentarily let down his guard and paid with his liberty. Reinforcements were soon on the scene. I'm very pleased. I'm quite surprised that she kept hold of him. I thought he was going to wriggle out of my grip. Um, but, you know, I'm pleased and we can put him back in his aviary with all of his other vultures, you know, so he'll be happy at home again. Tonight, a chastened Foster was on his way back to Banham Zoo, where the errant vulture will now undergo intensive retraining. John Brain, BBC News, Raiden in Suffolk. Well, that's it for now. There'll be more from the newsroom at 10 o'clock on BBC One. And, of course, there are news updates throughout the evening over on BBC News 24. Good evening. London has just enjoyed its hottest day of the year so far. That is until tomorrow. We've still got the blue skies across the London skyline at the moment, in fact blue skies across many parts of England and Wales, just a little bit more in the way of cloud for Northern Ireland and Scotland and a few showers here too. Now I hinted that it could be even hotter in London tomorrow, we're probably looking at a top temperature around about 30 degrees for the start of Wimbledon but during Tuesday and Wednesday it looks as though we're going to have an increasing risk of some thundery showers, some very humid air will be moving up from Spain and Portugal, as you can see here from the temperature maps. But not only uh, that humid, that very warm air, but a little area of low pressure as well. And that's very gradually going to be introducing that thundery weather hinted at of that Wimbledon forecast. Not tonight, though, just the odd shower on the western side of Scotland. For most of us, a dry night. Temperatures holding up fairly well in double figures. And then tomorrow, a bright start for many of us, but a few showers developing by the afternoon up through the Channel Islands, southwest England, into Wales as we go into the evening. Perhaps a few rumbles of thunder there, a few showers too for Northern Ireland and western Scotland. Generally top temperatures around 28 degrees, but of course we've got that 30 degrees to look forward to at Wimbledon. So this week it'll become hot and humid, then thundery, and then fresher later on in the week, but we'll probably keep some showers. And that's the forecast.
tiger's heart moving. That's what I call a proper jewel. A high-class villain. This is one of your more challenging tasks on the positive steel. With expensive tastes. A common thief. I want to work with you. His new partner in crime. Whatever's going on between you two, don't drag me into it. Nigel Havens. What do you think this is? The Three Musketeers? Michael French. What the same, eh? And Sir John Mills. It all becomes here. Gentleman Thief. Tonight at 9 on BBC One. Now on BBC One, the news in London and the South East with Mina Hussain. Good evening. A man has died and three others are fighting for their lives after taking drugs from a so-called bad batch at a nightclub in London. It's all they'd all been to the SE1 nightclub in Southwark last night. One man who's 19 and from the West Midlands was taken to hospital from near the club, but he later died. Another was discovered in a nearby alleyway, having fallen from a walkway above. He's one of three men aged between 19 and 21 who are still unconscious in hospital. Six other people have also been treated. It's believed they also were at the club last night. Police say clubbers had come from around the UK and the batch of drugs may have spread further afield. We know from our inquiries that so far that there are a number of individuals from the West Midlands, from South East London and Croydon and from the Middlesex area that were at the club. But potentially those drugs could have gone back to those areas and we would urge anybody with those drugs not to take them. Police are warning that some of the batch may still be in circulation. They're advising anyone who took drugs in or near the club last night to seek medical help, and they're appealing for anyone who may know where the batch came from to come forward. Chris Dearden, News from South East, South East London. The train company C2C has accused unions of playing politics at the expense of the passenger by organising a strike tomorrow. Commuter services on the line between London's Fenchurch Street and Essex will be hit when more than 60 guards from the RMT union walk out. The dispute centres on C2C's changeover from old slam door trains which need a guard to newer ones which don't. The train company says unions agreed a deal in December 1999, which will eventually see most trains operated by a driver on his own. It says unions have gone back on that agreement and are playing a political game. Our agreements do not extend driver-only operation and to postpone the current scheme on driver-only operation, that should have called the strike off because that's also about safety. The very fact that they won't call the strike off tells me it's maybe not actually just about safety. But the RMT says a local arrangement was made rather than an agreement. They say the report into the Paddington rail crash proves driver-only schemes are dangerous. The union added that 20 other train operators had already agreed with them and that C2C were acting prehistorically. Rebecca Garrett, Newsroom South East. And just a quarter of normal services will run tomorrow. Of course, there'll be full travel details on our breakfast bulletins. Six people were stabbed after fighting broke out at a traveller's wedding reception in Berkshire. It started inside a hotel in Reading but then spilled out into nearby streets. Police say up to 100 people were involved. A 26-year-old man has been arrested in connection with the stabbings. Now, if you were out making the most of the sunshine in central London today, you may have noticed a 50-foot chariot accompanied by colourful floats, musicians and dancers. It was all part of a huge Hindu festival. The gods arrived in style, swapping their up-to-date limo for a rather more traditional form of transport. A 50-foot chariot built for three. More than 5,000 Londoners from all over the capital took part in the 33rd annual carnival of chariots, marking the Hindu festival of Rathayatra, which celebrates the return of Lord Krishna to his home. Just like they have a parade with the Queen or something, and it's the deities. My whole family is here today. We come every year to celebrate. And festival organiser Ramesh Kaladai says it's an important part of the Hindu calendar. Not only Hindus, but other British people who are all coming down, they want to take part in this festival because it's good fun for them. But don't worry if you miss the fun this time. They'll be back next year. Your chariot awaits. Julia McKenzie, News from South East, Trafalgar Square. And that wasn't the only crowd puller in central London today. If you were one of the people out by the Thames at the Tate Modern, you may have seen a porpoise in the river. And if you look closely, you can get a glimpse of its fin. Animal rescue workers are on hand to try and encourage the creature back to sea. Let's hope he makes it. That's it. We're back in breakfast news tomorrow. Enjoy the sunshine and enjoy the rest of your evening.
The contest, one of the most politically charged arenas in the world. Money put forward was a recipe for complete and absolute uh, disaster. With unprecedented access to all the major players, this is the definitive account of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Anyway, I told him in rather graphic terms what my reaction would be if this didn't work out. No party prejudice, no political spin, simply the full story told by the people who were there making it happen. You can say this publicly and privately. There has been no secret deal with the IRA. Endgame in Ireland, tonight at 8 on BBC Two. A fierce ferret and a horse afraid of water. A new series of Barking Mad begins in 35 minutes here on BBC One after Songs of Praise with Diane Louise Jordan. Big sights, bright city lights, stars come out at night, smash box office hits, a mecca for music lovers, a capital for capitalists, big, brash, big-headed London town. Roger Royal presents Sunday Half Hour with a Reading Phoenix Choir at Bearwood College Chapel, Wokingham from 8.30 tonight on 88 to 91 FM, BBC Radio 2. Extreme Sunday. Here I am, doing everything in my power to kill myself. Jeremy Clarkson discovers a new drug. Oh, you show up. It's called danger. Isn't it great to be a human? Speed at 8 o'clock. Then join Steve Leonard. This is the most deadly snake in the world. For a close encounter. There's enough in here to kill me many times over. With a killer. Hey! <laughs> Ultimate killers at 8.30. Extreme Sunday, tonight from 8 o'clock on BBC One. Animals behaving badly now on BBC One. Need some expert help. Hello, welcome to Barking Mad.